Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. And uh, thank you, View Conference and, and Maria and Leva. This is my uh, this is my fourth time at the View Conference. So for all of you here in the audience, uh, particular thank you for not being tired of me yet. Uh, it's very kind of you to come to the talk today. Um, uh, and you know, my whole career, as as Barbara said, it's been in first animation and games. Now it's venture capital, but it's always been about digital media. Um, and, and some kind of uh, a computer graphics or, or digital experience. And I want to tell you a little personal story sort of leading up to this first. Um, you might recognize this chart. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average over the last five years. And, uh, uh, uh oh, right there, um, sometime in uh, the late summer of 2008 was the beginning of the, uh, uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now, this is the time for me to explain a little bit about what a venture capitalist do, because in my 30, almost 35 years of working, only in the last couple of years I've been a venture capitalist. So what a venture capitalist does, we go out and we raise money. We go out and we, we ask people to, to trust us with their money so that we can go invest it in game companies or digital media companies or interactive software companies and hopefully create companies that are very valuable and make our investors happy and help those companies grow. So for us to be a venture capitalist, we have to go out and ask people for money. That's when we started asking people for money. That was when we first started our fund, Vantage Capital. Um, arguably about the worst time in the last 60 to 70 years uh, to go out and ask people, hey, do you have any spare a few million dollars around? Would you like to invest it in us as a venture capital company? But we did it anyway, because that's when we were ready to go, and we knew it was going to be tough. And in fact, it was tough, and, and um, it took us um, over a year and a half. But in May of 2010, we raised our first $100 million, uh, Canadian, which is about the same as $100 million U.S. And then we closed our fundraising, so now we're up and running as a fund, as a $136 million uh, fund specializing in games and software. Now, I'm proud of the fact that we can start a new venture fund in this bad economic climate, but the reason I'm bringing this up in particular is um, the last time I was at you, two years ago, I talked about six digital trends. That was actually our pitch. When we went around to talk to investors, um, that was the presentation that we gave to talk about how rapidly and fundamentally things are changing in the world. Change and disruption is the venture capitalist's friend. What we look for are emerging companies, changes in the economy, changes in the way people do things, because established leaders continuing to be leaders isn't where the growth is. The growth happens when new companies come with disruptive business models, a fresh way of thinking of the world, where as a new company, they are going to grow and become a very valuable company. We'll talk more about that in the course of my talk. But one of the, the last of those six trends that we talked about in 2009 was gamification. And gamification was a very big part of what we used at Van Edge to raise the money that we raised for the fund. And there's a very, very important lens through which we look at the changes going on in the world today, and in particular, looking at uh, how we look at the, the possibility that companies might have a winning formula that allows them to be one of those disruptive and successful companies. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, a little bit more context, and we're going to do a brief history lesson in computer. We're going to, we're going to do the entire history of computers in the next two or three minutes, or at least personal computing. And as you know, when personal computers first came out, they were very machine-centric. This is not a particular friendly device. It's big and it's bulky, not because it's nice for the human or convenient, it's that's what the machine needed to be. Those giant CRTs were big and heavy because that's just the way you had to make displays. There was very little about this that was designed for the benefit of the human. It was to a large extent divide, make, built based on the needs of the machine. And if we just look at one little aspect of this computer, which is a game input device, for those of you in particular who have played first-person shooters, you will recognize that as the primary game input device. Again, not necessarily designed to be incredibly human-friendly, but 
Gosh, equipment's expensive, but we've got a keyboard anyway. Why don't we just use that? But over time, gaming interfaces started to evolve. They started to become a little bit more uh, ergonomic. Um, and with the, uh, with the consoles, particularly as we got into the six axis and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the motion sensitive controllers, they started to conform to your hands. The buttons were spaced exactly where they needed to be for your thumbs, and things started to get a little bit more human centric. Uh, the Wii, the Nintendo Wii, of course, continued that trend. So now there's controllers at Microsoft Connect, where the controller just disappeared completely, and the um, and and your body basically is the input device. So a lot of changes from machine-centric to human-centric use of computing devices. And if we look at how that works in the world of computing that we that we're all involved in living every day, the smartphone is a perfect example of that, which has been a massively disruptive technology. Um, but it's interesting, when you look at what's happening, it's a bigger disruption, because we, that's a phone. That's, that's what we call a phone. But in fact, what's happening is devices are revolving around poses of the human body. It's really not about the needs of the machine anymore. It's about how the human body works. So there's a computer that we use when we want to hold something in one hand and walk around and, and do something. Um, there's another computer called a tablet, which we use when we want to sit in a comfortable chair or a sofa and, and have something that's a little bit more comfortable to look like with a book. There's another thing we call a computer when we want to sit at a desk and, and, and be completely focused on our work. And there's another thing that we call a television screen when we want to sit in the comfort of our living room and have some friends over and, and enjoy a social experience. And we call these the phone, the tablet, or reader, computer, and TV. But in fact, that's not what they are anymore. They're all the same device. From a technology point of view, of course there's differences. There are, but the differences are subtle. They're basically all the same device. And the reason they're different devices is not because of the requirements of technology or the machine. It's because of the way the human body and human behavior is worked. And they're four different devices for four different poses. And, and what we historically call these things are simply now apps. The phone's an app. You can use the phone as an app. You might use it on your phone. You might use it, um, uh, I was talking to my sister the other day on my iPad, so it's an app there. It's, a, it's an app on any of these. And in fact, the reader's an app, computing's an app, and television is certainly an app. It's, it shows up in, in force on all of these things. So that's a major form of disruption, uh, a complete change in how we think about how we use technology, how pervasive it is in our everyday life, and the kind of role that it plays in that everyday life and the kinds of things it can do. From a business point of view, in some ways, it's even more disruptive. Uh, because in business, you always ask one of the first questions you do is you follow the money. Where is the money coming from? Where is it going? Who's the customer? What actually drives a record that could handle roughly 30 to 40 minutes on the side? Um, and it was a massive disruption to go from the LP to the compact disc. Uh, here, at least, it was similar from the 78 to the LP was at least similar technology, whereas from the LP to compact disc, of course, was, um, was, was completely different. But it was completely not disruptive in terms of who owned the customer and where the money flowed and how it flowed. You'd go to a record store to buy a 78, You'd go to a record store to buy an LP. You'd go to a record store to buy a compact disc. The way that music was recorded, the way it was physically distributed, the store that you would go to to buy it, those were all the same. Not anymore. So now with digital distribution, suddenly Apple takes the customers. The traditional distribution and retail patterns have completely changed. And not only has the technology changed, but the ownership of the customers, the ownership of the relationship between the producer and the public has completely changed. In the United States, iTunes is by far the largest retailer of music, uh, more than double the number two company, which is, which is Walmart. And this is just literally within a period of a handful of years. And when you think about those changes in relationships, we're talking about, in some cases, business patterns that have to go back to biblical times of people making things, going into the marketplace, someone comes to the store, says something to the store owner, hands over their money, 
walks away with something. That, that's a technology that's been there for thousands of years. And just across the board, um, especially for anything that can become digital, um, such as movies or books uh, or music, but even non-digital things, um, like, for example, in the U.S., one of the biggest shoe made, uh, retailers in the U.S. now is Amazon, with Apple's. Um, it's completely changed uh, the relationship between customer and provider, and it's massively disruptive. Another big change is we go back to our old friend, the early computer, and who, how many people uh, had personal computers back in the early days? Well, many of you are too young, but back in the early days. You all know what I'm talking about. How many people with their early personal computer that had someone, I don't know what the word is in Italian, in English we call it, geek or nerd? How many people were accused of being a geek? I have to put two hands up for that. Uh, and one of the reasons is, this is a very lonely machine. This is an isolated device. If you're on an early computer, by definition, you're by yourself. Nobody, you don't want to talk to anybody, nobody wants to talk to you. I'm busy right now, I'm on my computer, leave me alone. And of course, that's been a big change. Uh, this is a partial map of some of the social media companies uh, that are operating right now. We're, and we're, we're going to talk about every one of these. Oh, oh my gosh, no, we don't have time for that. But, just get, I mean, it's just, it's amazing, the explosion of social media. Uh, there's so many graphs I could show you about Facebook users, and you've seen all those kinds of things. We don't need to talk about the fact that it has become huge. And it's not simply people going onto Facebook, but it's companies realizing internally for their marketing and promotion purposes, uh, for, comfort, for, for people trying to find communities around particular sets of interest, that social media, in particular engineering social connection, is a fundamental and central part of computing. So now, when people go onto their computers, there is not to be alone, it's to connect. Um, I have two daughters, 20 and 22 year old, watching them over the last five years in particular, is very interesting. They went to the computer primarily to talk to their friends. It was 180 degree change in the role of the computer in their life. It was their primary social appliance, was the computer. And in fact, if you look where value was created over the course of the last 30 plus years, Microsoft, of course, created huge value by being synonymous with compute. When you think personal computing, some of us think Apple, but many people think Microsoft. So, you know, so if you had to boil that company down to a word, they were about computing. Well, along comes Yahoo and said, well, we're going to build a company around browse. Uh, this is a, a, a completely different metaphor, but fundamentally um, a dividing line between a metaphor that happens in isolation versus a you know, sort of key driving verb that is world that lives in a connected world. Google came along said, well, this world's starting to explode. Browse really isn't the most powerful way to look. Uh, maybe searching's a more powerful way, but still in that connected world. And then, of course, Facebook came along with a different metaphor altogether. And the dividing line there is being connected primarily with Yahoo and Google, being primarily connected in the world of data versus being connected to your friends. And um, it's very interesting to watch as these major companies that dominate the technology era, as each one comes up, um, it has a metaphor that seems maybe trivial from the perspective of the one before it. But if it's the right metaphor timed for the right change, there's a creation not only of world-changing companies and technology, but of course, if I look at it from a, a investment point of view, that's where the value is made as well. So tracking these trends and understanding how these changes happen is very important uh, if, you're, if you're in my business and actually we're all in my business. I mean, whether you're building games, whether you're making animation, we're all in the business of looking at the world, tracking changes, and trying to make our personal bets on what's going to happen next. And of course the last big change, and so famously by the late great Steve Jobs, is that computers have become the cross-section between technology and the liberal arts. Um, the, uh, it used to be that computers were used primarily for math or for science or maybe for accounting. And of course now we can carry YouTube around on our iPhones and, uh, and, and play games on every device that we have. Uh, computers are really an appliance for, for every field of knowledge. So in summary of this part, what, digital experiences were machine-centric, now they become human-centric. They're isolated, now they're connected. Uh, they work for a few things. Now, for everything. And 
The last part of this is, if you think about the old metaphor of computers, when people thought about computers, or what software was supposed to be and how it was supposed to perform, what tasks were done on computers, it was really all about efficiency. The old computer with your spreadsheet to do your accounting, that was about efficiency. Almost all of our old metaphors about computing and software are about efficiency, but of course that world's changing very rapidly. And it's really about engagement that I want to talk to you about today. About what makes digital experiences engaging. What, what captures the imagination and the emotion of users and engages them emotionally as well as give them an efficient way uh, to do a task. And that brings me to gamification. The so gamification is really very straightforward. And it basically says, there is an art of game design. There's to a certain extent a science, but it's a practice of game design about making digital experiences, or I'll say any experience, because game design is not just computer games, but creating engagement. And we'll get into a, a lot more about what that means as we talk, but gamification is taking the principles of game design and applying them to things that aren't games. And we'll talk, of course, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Well, first, for the purpose of this talk, it really doesn't matter that we have a precise definition of a game. A game is a form of play. Um, it's got rules, goals, and challenges, and we're going to talk about some of these more in particular. Um, but it is a, it, it's, it's a structure of play that has some sort of rules and some sort of goals around it. And of course, games aren't new. Games have been around as long as there's been people, whether they've been athletic contests, or old games of chance, or dice, or, or old board games. But this idea of play, playing for engagement, playing within a set of rules, playing for it with a set of challenges, that's as old as civilization. Um, and it's also, um, um, it can also be very technical. And this is a, this is a, a, a path-breaking book from 1948 on game theory. And what, the, what, game, theory, what, what, what game theory did and does is to start looking at some of the transactions that happen between people in a game and starting to put a mathematical framework around it. Because different players have different information at different times. Their odds of success change, but their perception or ability to calculate their own odds of success are a function of what they know or don't know. And it's a fairly complicated set of relationships that can be described mathematically and modeled out. And the reason I'm showing this, and then this next slide, which are two best-selling books, uh, the one on the left about psychology um, and the games people play um, as they navigate their way through status or communication relationships, or the one on the right, the gamesman, about how people manage their careers, is basically to point out that all the world is a game. Now, I want to be clear about this. I, I took a negotiation class probably 20 years ago. And in that class, the instructor said, everything is a negotiation. And, and you know, we thought he was going to talk about contracts and business. He said, how many people here are married? Your relationship with your, with your spouse is a negotiation. And as he got, of course, we were all saying, no, that's so cold-hearted. And really, all he meant by that is this is that in life, you are constantly negotiating. It may not be a hard negotiation like you might do with a contract, but two people walk towards the door. Who's going to walk through first? It's very subtle sometimes, just the eye contact or the body language, but generally people don't collide. There's a negotiation that happens. People work out the problem. There's a subtle set of signals. One person moves through the door, the other doesn't. People are standing in the room, and the boss comes in. People negotiate their space to indicate per, uh, importance of people. Um, you talk to your spouse about um, whether you're going to have dinner together that night or not. It's a negotiation. And his point was is that whether they're subtle, whether they're negotiations you have with a tremendous amount of affection and love, or whether it's business, we're constantly negotiating. The point here is that those no negotiations um, are one of the major components in the game. And a book like The Games People Play was simply pointing out that a lot of the relationships that we have and the way we manage our status or what we get in life, that there's actually some games that people generally play. And they play them on a regular basis. And you can look at these games, understand them, and learn from them. 
Well, the game industry itself looks at a very narrow set of games, uh, and these are games primarily for entertainment, whether it's uh, uh, going out and, and winning past wars or fictional wars, or, or, uh, or, or battling in mythical universes, or uh, uh, somehow you know the birds are angry, so we're going to throw their things and try to make them less angry. Uh, uh, solitaire, the biggest game of all time. I think more people spend more hours on Solitaire than any other game. Uh, but the point is that the game industry has gotten very, very good at designing to engage people for literally billions of hours. Uh, in aggregate, actually, uh, millions and millions of years of, of, of time spent playing these games. Um, and that's great. It's a big industry. There's a lot of you in the room here who, who work in that industry. But, there's, but, but here's an interesting question. And I'll, and I'll pose I gave a workshop at Citibank um, in March in New York City. And it was about 40 Citibank executives, from vice president to executive vice president up to directors, on gamification. And the question they asked is this. We know our customers are spending billions of hours playing these games. Yet many of our customers won't spend even a couple of minutes a year balancing their checkbook or making sure that they don't default on their credit card. Why is it someone will spend hundreds of hours trying to make the angry birds get their eggs back, but they won't protect their own eggs of their own family by making sure that they don't default on their credit cards? And it's a huge problem. People love these games. There's nothing wrong with that. But they take tremendous amount of attention and engagement well, there's a lot of other problems and issues that need to be solved. So one of the central questions in gamification is, is there a way that we can use the, game, the engagement that comes from good game design to get people engaged in doing things that might actually not be playing a game? Now, it turns out, um, uh, it turns out that it's very, very, it's turned into a very controversial area. When we started, when I first started talking about gamification through the internet, which is over... Uh, it was, the first pitch was two, yeah, all three years ago. Um, it, the word was not very well known. It was, a, it was not a well-known concept. It's already gotten very controversial. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the controversy and, and, and the name of my talk here. So we're going to talk about one. I'm going to talk about a few principles in, well, that good games embody. One thing. This is the magic mirror from Snow White. Good games present a flattering mirror. When you think about a good game, you want a game that makes you feel like. You're really smart, strong, and fast, or you're deadly and powerful. These are all Y chromosomes. These are all for the males, by the way. These are these are things that when we have a Y chromosome and we're male, we love feeling these things. Uh, deadly, powerful, fast, cool, rich, and fast. But every good game, whatever it is, every good game holds up a flattering mirror to the player, one way or another. And it's got to be a mirror. It can't just be a picture. You know, if I have a picture in my bathroom of Tom Cruise, and I go in in the morning and I look and I say, hey, I look a little bit like Tom Cruise, I, I'm not that smart a guy, but after three or four days, I'll probably figure out that's not a mirror. That's just a picture of Tom Cruise. It has nothing to do with me. A good mirror reflects something of me. It may distort it. It may be a selective reflection. But a good game reflects the player back in a way that has something to do with their actual skills and experience in a way that makes them feel good about themselves. It makes them feel that they're a winner, that they're smart, that they're courageous, that they're fast, there's something that's good about them. Well, one way to reflect back positively to someone is to give them a reward, to say you've achieved something. And that's where badges come in. And badges are great. Um, I was a Boy Scout when I was a young boy, and I get, you know, you, you, I got the, I was a little nerdy, so the first merit badge I got was the coin collecting merit badge, but, you know, I felt great about it. I had an award that showed that I did something, and every time you got a badge, it was an indication of achievement. Well, badges are cheap to make in a digital world, so now there's companies like Foursquare, or companies like uh, a Badge Bill, or Big Door, or Bunch Ball, uh, and these are all fine businesses. They're great businesses, but what they've done is to take an aspect of game design, which is hold that flattering mirror up by giving people achievements, and turn that into gamification. In itself, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very important element of game design. But where it's starting to get kind of controversial is, is that as we start to get more and more badges, 
And as you get like the prompt award for checking in four times at the same place in one night because you're out partying, um, you really start to ask, is there going to be a point where people, it just all starts to blur together and people just don't care about badges anymore? Does this really have anything to do with people's lives or what they care about? And the fact is, I think gamification as a word, and to a certain extent as a concept, is heading for a crash. So um, I don't know if, if, how many people here have seen this. This, uh, this is called the uh, uh, the the hype charts uh, from from Gartner Research. People seen this before? Anybody? Just a couple of hands. This, but just as an aside, this is a fascinating chart. Just look up um, on Google uh, uh, hype chart or or Gartner Research hype chart. They, it's a consulting firm that produces these things, and typically when they do it, they have a hundred or more technologies on here. And the idea is that when a new technology comes out at the technology trigger, there starts to be a lot of press and a lot of hype and a lot of inflated expectations. And people get very, very excited about it. It gets on the cover of magazines, people get invited to view it and talk about it, and, and people get very excited. Well, with gamification, um, the most common use of the word gamification and where companies are starting to build businesses around it is around badges. And at some point, and I think it's happening, people are just going to start burning out on badges. And then at some point, people are going to say, we really want a game on top of everything. I, I had a good friend who I had been talking to gamification about for months. And then at one point she asked me, because we were talking about the City Corp um, workshop, and she said, you know, but here's what I don't get. If you are on your phone and you want to look at your bank checking account balance, why do I want to have to play a game first? And there is the problem, the misunderstanding, is that gamification is not just about badges, and it's certainly not about putting games in the way of things. It's not about decorating with games or game mechanics. It's about something much more important and fundamental. So as an example, um, here's a screen from Stack Overflow that does a very good job. How many people here are on Stack Overflow? Probably a few of you. So those of you who are on it, you know this is a worldwide community, a uh, technical community, and it's a place where people can ask and answer quite technical questions. Now, these are badges from Stack Overflow, but the difference is these are badges with meaning. And if you look through um, some of these different ones, um, the, um, uh, these all refer to behaviors that are actually positive and valuable behaviors within a knowledge community that is working together to answer each other's questions. And what these things do in aggregate, and I'll just go through them, I mean, you can see there's a lot of these. Uh, you know, good answer. You answer, you, got, you get scores for the answers, for the, you get a score for the quality of questions you pose, the score comes from the community. You get scores for the quality of answers. But this is about building a community of trust. It's really all about having a system that tries to score how big a contributor someone is to the community and how well they're trusted. So all these badges are badges that are actually distillations of good behavior in a community that cares about that behavior. And as a result, they're great badges. They're badges that actually mean something. They have context and meaning within the community. As I say, there's a lot of them. And then as people get their badges and their points, they aggregate, and these are the current top contributors uh, uh, with, within, the, within the world of Stack Overflow. So they are heroes within a very specialized community that happens to be very important to them. It's a great use of, of gamification. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. Here's a much simpler version, but also very effective. Um, eBay uses the colored stars just to indicate how many transactions somebody has which in a world, again, of trust and knowing that someone has a history, knowing how many transactions they've done at a glance can be very important. Now, this is a very small piece of gamification, but this field is growing very fast. In fact, there's, a, there's an excellent book on building web reputation systems. And of course, if you go to the reviews on that on Amazon, they have their own reputation. So, so um, Eric Goldman got the most helpful favorable review on web reputation systems because 13 of 13 people found his review helpful. So the reputation systems are a piece of gamification, but they're everywhere. Well, as I mentioned, it's really about meaning. Uh, there's a parody site called Progress Wars 
that really is a, I, it's a hilarious illustration of that point, which is if you go to Progress, you just go to progresswars.com, and you'll see um, if, if, if the whole idea, if someone says gamification is simply not showing you progress and giving you achievements, then simply moving to Progress War should be a lot of fun. So if you go to progresswars.com, here's the game. Your mission. Chase away enchanted motorcycle hunter stranglers wielding invisible bandy clefts. And the way you play the game is you push the button to perform the mission, and when you push it, the progress bar moves forward. You push it again, the progress bar keeps going, and then finally you complete the mission and then you get a new mission. Oh, now we're going to flip out and kill dealers. Um, these things are random generated. It's uh, Jacob Spurgeon, I, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, has done a brilliant job of parodying this, of showing what happens when you strip a game down to the essentials and completely take the meaning out of it. But here's another progress bar for it. Now this is from Pulse Energy in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And it's really, in a sense, the same thing. Only in this case, um, this, what, here's what they're doing. Pulse Energy is a company that puts in energy monitors in the buildings. So they can track in real time exactly how much energy buildings are using. And they also display the dashboard so that the people who are in those buildings can see exactly how much energy their building is using at any given time. So as an experiment, they, they, they started this competition. They took four different sites, and these are four buildings in four different locations, and some of them were in different cities. And what they said is, relative to the energy you have been using as an average, every time you save one kilowatt hour of energy, the little car for your building will move forward uh, uh, 6.25 kilometers. So now you have a game. You have a race between four different places, and they're competing to see who can save the most energy. All it is is a progress bar. But now there's a context, there's some competition, but most importantly, there's meaning. They're competing on something that they actually care about. Now, one of the ways we know they care about it is because, uh, in this case, they saved about 13% of energy. Overall, energy usage went down in these four buildings for the duration of this experiment. Um, uh, because they wanted to, they not only wanted to win, but they wanted to save energy. People care about saving energy. Now, I have heard, I haven't seen the data, but one of the ways people notice this works is apparently there's some study out there, and I've got, I've got to find it. It says that when you put energy mon mon uh, uh, monitors into people's homes, in the U.S., if it goes into the home of a conservative Republican, the energy goes up. I'm not joking about this. That people who don't believe in global warming, if you give that to them, they'll say, damn it, I'm going to prove these liberals wrong. And they just start turning on all their lights and watch how much energy they can use. But the point is... Uh, that's called the law of unintended consequences. Uh, but the point is, is that this kind of feedback, even when it's a very, very simple game, uh, can, be, can be very powerful. So, with the rest of the time I have today, I want to talk a little bit about gamification and how it's starting to get narrowed down into the sense of badges and, and point out a couple of things. One is it's not about necessarily even building a full game. It could just be about using game design. It's not about entertaining, although that's a part of it. It's really about engaging people in something. It's not about badness. It's not about meaning. And ultimately, like any good design, it's not about just a bunch of tricks or mechanics. It's about human nature. So I think the most important thing in gamification is to find the game that's already there. If all the world is a game, if we're always playing games, if you're a student, you're playing a game with... How do I get the courses I want? How do I get the grades that I want? How do I get the teachers that I want? How do I get the like people? We're always playing a game. So here's, uh, here's a problem that we have. That was our logo when we first started out. We just slapped something together. Um, we wanted a better logo, and that's the logo that we ended up getting. But when we went to talk to design firms, uh, we got quotes up to $50,000. We said, you know, really? We're a startup company. Do we really have $50,000 to pay for, for a logo? Now, I think I showed this example here two years ago, but I, I, it's a personal example, so I love it. I, we went to the site called Logotournament.com, and what we did was, so this is, the, we, we're not an investor in them, but it's a great site. What they do is they do logo tournaments. And we started a contest for our logo. It took me about 20 minutes to set it up. And uh, 
Uh, the way this works is anybody can go. By the way, if any of you, I've had so many friends who have seen this and they've gone out and had their own logos designed. So if you have a small business and want to do a logo, it's very controversial, we'll talk about that in a minute, but if you want to get a logo designed, um, I wanted a great logo. So the, the normal purses go between $200 and $1,000, so I thought we're going to go on the rich side. We said $600 is the award. It's 10 days, and then the way it works is you get some sliders, and you can say, I want my logo to be more ma masculine or feminine, more traditional, more contemporary, colorful, and so forth. But I make all the sliders, and then the contest starts. Well, here's what I observed. First of all, I started getting in some entries. And the entries came from all over the world. We got entries from, uh, from Greece, Egypt, Philippines, Romania, uh, India, certainly a lot of India, Italy, Canada, U.S. They came from all over the world. So we started getting entries. Uh, my first college degree was as a fine arts major. So one thing I know about art is, is that the, what motivates artists is good critique. So good, respectful, honest critique about what's working and what's not. So the first thing, and I'm fairly competitive, so I want, the average number of entries in this contest is about 100, and I wanted to do better than that. So I was up until about 2 in the morning every night giving critiques back to the entries about exactly what I liked and what I didn't like about each entry, and that got more entries. Well, uh, my wife's also an artist. We started realizing because people were uh, sending things from all over the world. Every morning we woke up, there were more entries, so we got up all excited each morning, ran to the computer to see the new ones. And what I realized is I was, I was playing the game. It was so engaging. It was so much fun. Now, I wasn't doing this purely for entertainment. I was trying to solve a problem. But I was having a blast doing it, and I was having so much fun that my wife got into it. We were both judging these things and ordering and having fun. And I spent far more hours on this than I ever would have normally in this context. And when we picked out the final award, I talked to the designer. He won, um, he, he won uh, $510, because it was a $600 award. 15% went to logotournament.com. 85% went to the designer. So let's say he gets an average of $500 an entry. He's been in 300 contests, um, but he's only won 18. So he's won roughly $9,000 or $30 an entry, but it's a game for him too. When I took him down from gold one time to bronze, he got, I sent an email, could you please just only take me down to silver? He doesn't get any money for silver, but he's looking at his ranking, his score. So the point is that the game can be have a purpose. Uh, but if you, uh, any, any, uh, any football fans in here? Do you guys think games are meaningless? Nobody really really cares? They're just fun games? No, in Italy, I think people care about that game very much. Um, games can have a purpose and a meaning, but they can still be engaging and be fun. So it's efficient and engaging. Uh, this is a company we just recently invested in, and it's going to be, this is an emerging field, so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Uh, this company is called Recon Instruments, and what they do is they put heads-up displays into ski goggles. And you can see the little display right there, uh, and then this just kind of blows up some of the kinds of things that you can get while you're skiing. Well, that's already kind of interesting. So if your phone rings, you can see who's calling, you don't have to take your mittens off. Um, you can get things like temperature reports or what the weight lines, what, how long the lines are at various ski lifts. So you have all that built right into your ski goggles. Um, but what's really going to be interesting is now they're starting to gamify it. And this is getting into an area where it's like the metagame of skiing because skiers tend to be very competitive, a lot of them, or at the very least, they want to be able to talk about, or in some cases brag about, um, the length of run they were able to do, the speed they were able to reach, the air time they were able to get. And what they have is their HQ site is basically now gamifying the process of a community of skiers sharing information about their ski runs. There's leaderboards, there's challenges they can set for themselves. It's just emerging. So they have very simple gameplay now, but I think they're really on to something, which is take a community that's already playing that game, that already cares about these things and communicates these things, then use good game design to draw that out and build a much more tightly designed experience around it. So, so it's a new area, but it's, uh, uh, it's exciting, and, and it's, as we say, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll see where this one, if I'm back at you next year, someone needs to ask me how they're doing, and we'll, we'll see how that does the work. 
Um, another, we talked about eBay before, but a simple example is game theory. Uh, it's a very subtle one, but the auction design in eBay is very much a matter of game design. So one way of looking at games is to say, um, it's really games are built out of engagement loops. Um, it's what keeps me engaged, what keeps me interested. And a useful way to break it down is just to break it down by time dimension. A good game is fun within seconds. I pick up a controller and I move Mario and I'm delighted in how he moves around or how he jumps. Something about the game feels good, it feels solid. Within seconds there's something that feels good. But that's just first impressions, but it's important because it's not fun on a second-to-second -second basis. Everything else uh, will feel bad. Uh, but when you get to minutes, now you're getting into tactics. And you can go from hours to days to months within games, but those verbs can apply to anything, not just games. So whether on a minute, so for example, in a game, it may take me a couple of minutes to figure out how to go from here to figure out how to get through the gate and go outside the wall and, and, and go out and explore the world. Well, in the world of Recon HQ, minutes might be how long it takes for me to go out and do a quick run or to post something. But then there's the hours you spend in strategy, which is really planning things and organizing tactics. The days you spend with big campaigns and really planning things on a large scale basis. And then the months or years you spend, uh, as in Stack Overflow, being in the community and building up your reputation. Um, as I said, good gamification doesn't necessarily have to be a full game. So for example, with Nike, they realize the process of designing a shoe can be a lot of fun, um, and it's very game-like. Um, and in fact, you can not only have fun, so you can see that's just the raw shoe. Now jump ahead to step five out of 11. I'm customizing my shoe. I want to make sure it looks like nobody else's shoe, so I did that to it. I'm um, at step eight out of 11, and then at step nine out of 11, I can personalize it as Vantage Capital, and I'm done with my shoe. So it's not a game, but it has been gamified. It's using game design and game feedback. Um, a much more important one, um, and a subtle one, and I'll go through this quickly, but um, if you think about where you work, um, how many people here have jobs, regular jobs, real full-time jobs? And how many people, of, of, keep your hands up. Of the people with your hands up, keep your hand up if you're also a gamer. Okay, so everybody look around, the people with their hands up, keep your hands up. Okay, uh, ask them about this at the break. Because what I'm about to talk about is, think about what makes a game a good game. And think about what would make the place you work a beautiful, wonderful place to work. And I did this, this is out of a, a piece that I wrote in Electronic Arts probably five or six years ago, because I started thinking, we're a game-making company. Is there something we can use about what we know about making games to make this a better place to work? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized they're exactly the same thing, or they're almost exactly the same thing. And it's not a coincidence, it's because it's about human nature. Uh, a good game will balance challenges and rewards. In other words, you get to gain a mastery of what you're doing. You have very tough tasks, but you are able to succeed in them, learn something, and move on to even tougher tasks. In other words, you can ramp your learning. Um, a good game and a good workplace gives you clear feedback. How am I doing? How am I doing today? How am I doing this week? How am I doing this year? Um, a good game and a good workplace, there's accountability. If somebody does something great, everybody knows about it. If somebody messes something up or does something really badly, in a game you lose your life. How many people work in companies where the accountability gets a little vague, something went bad, we don't know who's responsible. It's accountability for good things and for bad things is important in a good workplace. And a good game to allow for both competitive and collaborative play because different people play differently. But ultimately, a good game, you can win. And the design of a workplace, if people simply looked at their workplace and said, our company is going to be rated in game magazines based on how well it's designed, I, I think everybody's life, personally, I think everybody's life would be happier, I think companies would be more productive, um, and I think people in companies would win a lot more. That, to me, is the real promise of gamification, is recognizing that at the deepest levels, the design of games reflects human nature, 
And we're all playing games all the time, but if that's the case, we can design those games and we can design those processes and that software better. Now I'm going to skip over a couple of things. There's a lot of information here about gamification and advertising, but I'm just going to point you to a couple of examples from Blast Radius, which is a uh, advertising company in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. This is a very simple game they did with Starbucks. So uh, when Starbucks introduced, or any company introduces a new product, that's a very expensive proposition. And we've got a new kind of coffee. How do we get people to be aware of this? How do we convince people to try it? Uh, th these are very expensive marketing programs. So what they did is they turned it around. And they said, let's make a game out of this. Uh, what you're going to do, we're only going to introduce this in just a few Starbucks. We're going to roll this out, I don't know what percentage, but a fairly small percentage of Starbucks. So people had to vote that their Starbucks, their local favorite Starbucks, should be the one that had the privilege of trying out this new drink. And people competed all over North America for the right to try this. Well, of course, the day the drink came out, for the ones that won, it was a big thing. Our Starbucks won. It was a big party. It was a celebration that they won. Everybody came in, tried the drink. It was hugely, it was so successful, in fact, that Starbucks has moved almost their entire marketing budget away from traditional media now into social media and a lot of that social media uh, is gamified. This is also from Blast Radius, but there's so many good things that Nike does, so a lot of them come from Blast Radius. Very, very simple. Uh, your shoes monitor how far you run. They just pitted neighborhoods against each other. They just had contests to say which neighborhood, these are two neighborhoods in Chicago, Illinois, which two neighborhoods in this period this specific period of time are going to run the most. And it was a way for neighbors now. Is there a lot of meaning in this? No, not a lot. Could you sustain this for years? Maybe not. But as anybody who follows professional sports knows, there's something magic when it's your local place competing against another place in any athletic competition. This is probably, this is progress force for athletics, but it's tied to people's neighborhoods where they live, so suddenly it has meaning. Uh, the last couple sets of slides I'm going to show you just talk a little bit about what I think is the highest level of gamification. We talked about challenges and rewards. Uh, there's a great book called Flow, which is about the psychology of peak experience. And I'm just going to go over this. The, the, the problem with so many software that exists now is that there's a lot of challenges. It's hard to use, but not a lot of rewards. Actually, a lot of workplaces, too. And that can lead to frustration. It can lead to a very painful situation. But equally, you can have software or experiences where things are just too easy. You get lot G, that's great, that's, but you're not learning, you're not gaining mastery, you're not challenging yourself, and that leads to boredom. If you have too much, if it's things are too easy, and of course, what flow really is in any experience, whether you're designing a game or designing a workplace, it's just about finding the right rhythm. And there's different rhythms for different tastes and different situations. But it's finding the right rhythm where if you just do a straight line, it gets boring. So it's finding out what that curve looks like. It's like music. You have to find the right pace and the right rhythm. But how do you get that nice pacing of rewards and challenges so that it's just hard enough to people keep challenging themselves and learning something, but just rewarding enough that they don't feel like they're an idiot and want to give up? keeps them in the zone where they feel like this is really hard, but I can do it and I keep learning. So that's flow. Uh, the very last thing I want to show you is uh, what I think is one of the most exciting and um, uh, interesting examples of this. Uh, it's not this, but this is the setup. How many people remember the SETI project? S-E-T-I, Search for Intelligent Life? Well, if you remember, it was a very interesting experiment in using computers worldwide to search for intelligent life. Um, very, it was very, very successful, and what it did was it asked people to turn their personal computers over to analyzing um, various, various radio signals to look for patterns that might indicate some sort of intelligent life. And they, they were able to get hundreds of thousands, or I have the numbers, maybe millions of computers worldwide. They did try to make a slight game out of this, which they started to give awards for people who did the most computing time. People instantly started to cheat. So they had to put in some anti-cheating mechanisms. So they'd send the same signals out to multiple people and correlate the results. So they could tell us if one person was cheating, they'd throw them out. But it wasn't really a game. Um, now, it didn't really turn, but it, it was a great success in terms of getting people to use their computing time. They never actually found intelligent life. I'm not even sure they found any on Earth, but they certainly didn't find any in the universe. 
but it's an interesting example of, of large-scale scientific exploration. Well, the next example I want to show you is from the University of Washington, from the Game Science Center for Game Science. Um, this, I believe, is one of the most interesting places on the planet that's looking at gamification in a really deep way. So if you wanted to go online and look at someone who's really doing groundbreaking work, everything that's coming out of this lab is, uh, is, is interesting and some of it's quite amazing. Uh, their game Fold that was in the news recently, um, here's the way this game works. Uh, how many of you here have heard of Fold, first of all? A, a few of you. Um, here's the way this game works. Um, protein, I, I, all I know about protein folding is what I learned from, 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 uh, from, from Foley, so, so bear with me. And there's, I'm sure there's some molecular biologists in the audience here that will they'll take me aside afterwards. But, but basically, the, the, what we, under, we understand with proteins, we understand how proteins are linked together. That's well understood by scientists. The structure of a protein and how the different atoms and pieces are linked together and what are legal links is very well understood. What is not understood is how a particular protein folds itself. These are very complicated structures that can fold in multiple ways. And in any given piece of a protein, there are some sites that are, for example, very receptive to certain chemicals, other sites that, that, that aren't. And how a protein is folded determines on what bases go to the outside world and has everything to do with how that protein actually behaves in a biological situation. The problem is, is that there are an intractable number of possible folding possibilities for any given protein, and computers tend not to be good at that kind of visual pattern matching. To be able to look at, for example, at flattened um, electron microscope images of proteins and take the legal structure of the protein and understand how, all, how you can fold that protein to get to what people are actually observing or the behavior they're observing. It's a very hard problem. So what the guys at the University of Washington did said, let's make a game. People are actually good at visual pattern matching. And actually, hundreds of thousands of people are good better at this problem than one person. So we'll make a game. And each level of the game, when you start, teaches you a different aspect about how proteins actually fold. It's a fun game. It's a very well-designed game. They've made it fun. But what you're learning in the course of doing this is how proteins fold. Well, then after you've gone through the tutorials and you start moving up, you start getting real proteins to fold. And as you start getting better and better, you start getting more and more complex proteins. And what they're doing now is they're running experiments. They're running uh, live experiments through this and asking the community to find the right folds for uh, proteins that have eluded science. So they recently, the reason they were in the news is several players of this game recently got credit as co-authors in, in an article that was published, published in Nature. Uh, they figured out the right folds for a uh, monkey HIV virus that people had been looking for for 15 years. And it was just too tough a problem. They knew there was a solution. It was just too hard to get to it. Well, when you get hundreds of thousands of people playing a game, having fun doing it, at some point the answer is going to come out, which it did. So now they're up in the ante. And I was there a couple of weeks ago talking to Zoran Popovich, who runs the lab. It's an incredibly ambitious agenda he's got for protein problems. They're now starting to line up to run through this program. It's just a game. It's a really fun game. It's a, it's a simple, free game that you can download. It's just a game. But in that game, he estimates that in, the, in over a three-year period, the world has seen an increase of, of, of knowledge of people who are experts at faulty, protein folding. There's been a two to three x increase in the number of expert protein folders um, in, the, in, in the world over the, over, over the course of a couple of years, just because there's so many people doing it. Uh, this is one of about 10 games that they're doing for that lab. So if you're interested in gamification, particularly in the application of science, uh, uh, that's what I would Google right there. Very interesting work. And it's a good place to end because, as I said from the beginning, uh, gamification is not about gimmicks. It's not just about badges. It's not even about making money, although in my case it's certainly part of the professional interest. It's really about human nature and recognizing the game design industry has learned and understood a lot about what engages people and makes things interesting and exciting for them. But there is a whole world out there outside the game business where that knowledge and insight can be put to use.
Thank you very much.